You're listening to the Co-Creator Network. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Dr. Jennifer Howard, the author of Your Ultimate Life Plan, and this is A Conscious Life. Oh, I'm so glad that you're here today. Thank you so much for taking your time to be here. And I hope that as we listen to some great guests, we all grow and move toward having a more conscious life. That's the way toward more freedom and happiness. Um, Follow me today at Dr. Jennifer on Twitter, hashtag a conscious life, or on Facebook forward slash Dr. Jennifer fan page. Well, I'm so excited to be here today, and I have uh, one of my favorite people in the world. I wish we could talk more often. Um, She's, everybody loves her. (laughs) I'm just one of her fans, probably, but I just adore her and enjoy her energy and her connection and her realness. Um, But before we introduce her, I just want to thank everybody for all your amazing comments uh, about my book, Your Ultimate Life Plan. Um, We haven't in the last two weeks opened it, but we're going to open it today. When you hear this, uh, go to yourultimatelifeplan.com forward slash launch. And you can, um, if you purchase the book today, you can go there and then download uh, some of those amazing gifts that people were so kind um, to participate in my book launch. So we'll, we'll extend that today if you hear this and and do it today. So I hope you will and let me know your thoughts and feelings about the book. So today we're going to have another Jennifer. I'm so excited. Jen Loudon is a personal growth pioneer and a best-selling author of six, including the woman's comfort book, The Life Organizer, uh, that have inspired more than a million women in nine languages. Jen has led retreats and workshops on self-care and creativity for 21 years. She started when she was five and has become a passionate proponent for teaching of all subjects in all venues as a way to change the world. Jen Loudon, are you there? I'm there, Missy P. (laughs) Nice to hear your voice. (laughs) Oh, I'm so glad to talk to you. How are you, sweetie? You know, I'm I'm deeply good. I'm deeply good and oh. deeply in love and spring is here and it's quite a happening where I live, spring. It just it happens and the energy just moves really fast and big. So it's exciting. It's an exciting time. I'm struggling a little bit to stay grounded. Sometimes I just want to kind of float away, but um or combust, but it's good. It's exciting times. Oh, I'm so glad. And congratulations on your future marriage. Yes, that's exciting too. I know. I'm Yay! Yay! I know. Well, I can't when? believe it. I'm doing it. <laughs> when is it? When is it? August 17th. August 17th. That's a few days before my birthday. Oh, well, an extra special day then. <laughs> oh, it's, it's exciting for you. And I, uh, you know, I've, I've been married, uh, this is my second marriage, but I've been married uh, to this gentleman. Well, we've known each other 21 years. So, uh, and married, I think it'll be 19. Uh, and it's, uh, it's wonderful. He's the right guy. And it's, uh, it's good. I mean, you know, it's not perfect. Nothing's perfect, but uh, it's good. Yeah. Well, I'm so excited. I mean, I, there's a couple of things I want to say to you. First of all, I want to thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm bowing towards you for giving me that amazing endorsement that you gave me for my wonderful book. And it's up some, for some awards, and I'll, I'll keep you posted on that. So it's, and if I, actually, it's a finalist for a few awards already. So That's works. exciting. What a good feeling. Yeah, after, yeah, it's my life's work. It certainly is. And I don't know if I ever told you this, but one Christmas, I bought your book, The Woman's Comfort Book, for every girlfriend I knew. Oh, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. That's before I even knew you. When I bought that book for everybody that year, I said, that's it. Everybody needs comfort. Mm-hmm. I'm sending it around. So it uh, was... Uh, that's fantastic. I'm very grateful. Well, it was very appreciated uh, to the lovely women that I sent it to. And, um, but we're going to talk about something that, that I, I, I've known about, but I really you know, did more research today because I was going to talk to you about it for an hour. Uh, this is an amazing program. Uh, it's called Teach Now. Uh, what inspired you to start this program? What, what made you think, gee, I think I need to do this? 
Well, you mentioned the Woman's Comfort book. That book was published when I was 28. And I, the, my publisher, Harper, um, Harper San Francisco, they got very excited about the book. And the New York office of, of Harper was like, this is it. We're going to put a whole lot of money into this book. And, and then they decided it was a little too new age. Remember, this was 1992. And I, I talked about lighting candles. And <laughs> that, that was a little, they, were, they couldn't get behind that. So, um, <laughs> I know, like there was essential oils in the book. Ah! So I decided I was going to have to get out and talk about the book. And so I organized my own book tour. And it was adult education, Saturday morning workshops, and all day events, and things in, you know, YMWCA basements and bookstores. And I booked this whole thing, little old me, driving my parents' Ford tourist station wagon around the United States for 8,000 miles in three months. But then I actually got into doing it, and I was like, holy, wow, holy Batman, Batgirl, Superman, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> I have no idea what I'm doing. And that, then the book became a word-of-mouth bestseller, and I started to literally be called to speak and to teach. And I just suffered, Jennifer. I suffered for so many years not knowing what I was doing. And this was before the Internet, everybody. And I would look for things to teach me how to teach, and I couldn't find anything that translated to what we call now self-enrichment or non-traditional teaching. It, it was just kind of out there. And so much of it was personal suffering. It was feeling not good enough at what I was doing, as well as the nuts and bolts stuff. And then about two and a half years ago, I was in conversation with a dear friend who was one of my spiritual teachers. I mean, he's really a master at his, his lineage. And he was struggling to really step into his teaching, not from a self-confidence point of view. Other issues were his issues. And I kind of just like hit me between the eyebrows and I said... I think I want to support teachers. And there the course started to get born because this is a really important takeaway, everybody. If you want to teach something, it's not that you have to have a certificate in it. It's not that you have to be the expert at it. You can take your life experience and you can beta it. I offered the first course for all of $108. And I made it up and I dug in with my friend Michelle Christensen's help because um, she helped me create the course originally. Like, what do I know about teaching? And then, here's another takeaway, everybody. You can call in experts. I started calling the experts like Mark Nepo and Parker Palmer and Elizabeth Lesser, who co-founded Omega, and saying, yes. talk to me. Let's record an interview. What do you know about teaching? Yeah, wow. so that's how that started. <laughs> you know, I, I got my undergraduate degree in teaching. I did not remember that because, of course, I'm menopausal and I have no memory. <laughs> it's okay. I am too. And, uh, and yes, I, I know who I am right now. That's all good. Um, <laughs> right. I don't have to look at my driver's license for my name. Hey, good. Um, yeah, I did my undergraduate in teaching. And, you know, I, at the time, it was the thing you did at my age. To, you know, you wanted to have that job that you could really get a job yes. later and you could have kids. And, of course, I don't have kids, but, you know. Who knew at that time all this whole life was going to unfold the way it did? And it has really served me. But I think even though I learned an education degree and I really learned how to break down lesson plans, and I know you help people with that in here, what you're talking about here is really anybody who's a speaker or anybody who does anything and has to communicate it, you're really helping them think that through too. What do they want to teach, which is something. Yeah, I, I do think we, we definitely have had about 650 people go through the course in the last few years, and we've definitely had a lot of people who don't identify as teachers, and fascinating, we've also had some very experienced teachers, you know, 20 plus years go through, and we've also had um, people who who want to teach but are afraid to embrace that word because they think it means traditional teaching or poverty or having to be in a classroom. So it's really been fascinating to me to learn how important it is to embrace the, I guess, the archetype of the teacher and really feel it into your bones. What does that mean for you as a central way to be a communicator, whether, like you said, you're a speaker or a, a writer or an artist or a traditional teacher? Does that make sense? Oh, it totally makes sense. And I was thinking about, 
the first time I actually said I'm a spiritual teacher, it was right. It was it was nerve wracking. It was like I can't be a spiritual. Te- what does that even mean, a spiritual teacher? I mean, that was so. I remember when I was in in teaching for a, a healing school at the time, and the guy who was the leader said, "Well, of course you're a spiritual teacher. What do you think you're teaching?" And I was like, "Oh, right." But there was something about that that felt too sacred for me, little old me, to be. Yes, exactly. So whether whatever word we put in front of teacher, it means claiming our own wisdom and honoring it, but it also means embracing how much more we don't know. And I think the traditional model of teaching that most of us have been exposed to in mo- at least the Western world is the teacher is, it's a hierarchical, it's a patriarchal, it's a top-down model. And so that's not what Teach Now preaches at all. It says, hey, you take your seat in the circle as someone who has had some experience, has some training, has this whatever to offer, whether it's knitting or WordPress or you know, collaging or, you know, spiritual healing. And then you, you step back into the circle and you let your students exchange information and teach you and you embrace, I don't know as much, if not more than you embrace, I know. And that's actually, that's can be freeing. And of course it's frightening because knowing is, is so much fun. (laughs) (laughs) You're funny. Well, and knowing is so much fun. I laugh because, of course, the older we get, the the more we realize we know nothing, and right. you know, we can just surrender to that. So, um, anyway, I'm laughing I, at my. I know for me, as a as a as a, now a teacher, and and because uh, I well, started as a teacher as a kid, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about teaching what I do now and teaching yeah. the breadth of knowledge that I have. I, I did have to reach for me personally a certain point of expertise. Sure. Uh, and a certain point of integration. Now, because I'm teaching something pretty deep and different, I mean, it's not knitting, so it's it's not as concrete as that. But mm-hmm. I did feel like I had to get a certain integration inside of me before I could step forth and, and do that. But what you're talking about is different kinds of teaching, not just that kind of thing, right? Right, right. But th- so that brings up two really fascinating points, Jennifer. One of the things that we talk about in module um, one of the course, maybe actually, it might be module one or module two, I don't remember. It's the, it's the path of teacher, of teaching. And so there's different places along the path that we grow into and we can be teaching in those different places and we help people assess where they are on the path and what's appropriate and honest for you to be offering. I am not a supporter of all at all of sort of some of the stuff we see online, for example, where like, I'm the expert, I'm the guru, pay me a lot of money. Well, really? Why? You know, what do you really have to offer me? And, And if you do have something to offer me, why does it cost that much? But right. I'm also I'm also not a um, I'm not a cheerleader for you. You need to be the expert before you can teach. So there's a lot of in between places that we help people assess where they're at, and that's true for very practical things. But we get plenty of people who go through the course who are spiritual teachers of different in different areas as well. So we help you know with that. How do you take these most more esoteric things and bring them into um, ways that people can can learn? But I think that's beautiful, Jennifer, and you're the perfect person to do this because um, there, and, and it does irritate the ever-loving mm-hmm, out of me to see people online profess to know stuff when I look at what they're writing and I want to go, what the hell? Um, no. and, they don't, and they don't know what they're talking about. And it's, it's like, oh, man. But what's great is you can say, I know this much. And I yes. wish certain schools I had gone to had told me this. Look, I know this much. Now, if you want more people, you can go to. Exactly. And actually, that's a beautiful way because one of the things we do touch on and teach now is how do you make a living doing this? You know, it's just part of the course, but how do you ethically make a living? And that you just touched on how one of the ways you ethically make a living by saying, I can, I can do this for you and not trying to drown your people or fake your people out. And then I can refer you to other people and you can have affiliate relationships with them. You can have referral relationships. You can have a nice network of friends to grow your business. And it can be so heartfelt and real. You don't recommend people or just pat them on the back so they'll recommend your stuff, but you really start to develop a network 
And in this round of Teach Now, I've invited five guest teachers to be on the live component. The whole course you can take at your own speed. It's there forever. It's asynchronous. But then there is a live component because I like to talk to people live. And those are, yes, you know, you don't, yes. have, you don't have to be there live if you don't want to. And you can send in your questions if you have one. But I invited these live guests for exactly that reason so I could refer some of the stuff that I'm not such an expert at to them and deepen and widen people's learning. Yeah, that's great. So you're really giving people permission to learn to teach what they know and to own what they don't know. I mean, I know that I've had many teachers, and you said this earlier, but I, I've had teachers through the years who really ha feel like they have to know everything, and they just lie when they don't, really. Yeah, um, it's a it's a very ancient model. <laughs> it's a very patriarchal model, and right. it leads to a tremendous amount of abuse. And in the spiritual world, it leads to a, pro to a tremendous amount of projection. And yes. we see that happening so much online. Where And I see people, this what really pisses me off, is I see people using that projection, creating yes. this life that looks so glamorous. And if I just buy your stuff, I'll have that life. Um, I, I think I, that's dangerous and, and, and not a good thing. I am so on board with you about that. I mean, first of all, nobody's life looks like that. <laughs> <laughs> they just don't. You know, the house is messy. The kid's hair is not right. They're drinking too much wine if they've got a glass of I mean, whatever. There's something <laughs> good going on because everybody's got stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, and then there's the other extreme where people tell everybody, Yes. You know, how many sweat beads they have on their armpits. And that's a little too much the other way. Like, whoa, I don't need to know all that, you know? Yes. That's something we talk about in Teach Now a lot is how do you find your voice in how you market, in how you teach, in your material, both from a perspective of, of owning what you know and being a unique offer that meets your just right students, but also this weird you know, authenticity thing, like what is really often authentic and what in the end serves your students. Right. Because that's really what teaching is about. It's about service. That's why I got in. That's the other reason I developed this program is my tagline went from, you know, comfort to savor and serve. How do we savor and serve life? And teaching, I think, is an essential part of this service work. And that does that and it doesn't have to be for money and it doesn't have to be in front of people. You may be teaching you are teaching people all the time. Um, yes. Yeah. That's I the other that. thing I wanted to say. That's the other thing I wanted to say though. This is why anybody can do this 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 wonderful thing you've developed here. Because we're all teaching all the time in different capacities. You don't have to formally be standing up or even sitting in a circle. We're constantly teaching with our presence, with what we say, with how we act in the world, with everything. Yes. And one of the, some of the people we have gone through the course who, who haven't thought of themselves as teachers have, have been writers. We've had a number of people who have gone through who are writers and artists. And I was you know, really interested in how they use the material either to market their, their writing and their art and be, from a teaching perspective or to create extra income streams, um, right. especially artists, or just to approach their art from a different perspective. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I was also thinking about, um, you have, um, one, I was looking at modules and things and I was thinking about you help people, and that was part of that projection thing you were saying. Mm -hmm. You know, as a therapist, what goes up must come down. So if everybody yes. has all positive projections all over me, that's okay. It's a phase people go through, and then they figure out that you actually do have to put deodorant on and et cetera. Um, <laughs> to not have BO, you know. I mean, it's like human. You're not, we're human. And uh, so you really help people work with, because there could be a lot of criticism coming at you. And how do you deal with that? And as a therapist, I've you know had to learn that a lot. And and also the positive projections. Can you talk a little about how you deal with that in, in the class? Sure. Well, one thing is 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 I I believe it's in module three or four. We just talk about projections. Like even that idea is is in it, kind of life sh life shaking for some people. Like oh, people project things onto me. It's part of teaching. I need to consider it and be skillful about it. And, and in the beginning, you may not be skillful about it at all, but don't pretend it's not going to happen. 
And then if you are skillful about it, know that this is the inner, as you become, I shouldn't say this, as you become skillful at it, know that this is part of the inner work of teaching. And that is half or more of the message of teach now. How do you use teaching anything as a spiritual, personal growth, psychological growth path? I and love that. I love that, Jen. That's just fabulous. I know. You I know. <laughs> Honey, God bless you. I love you. Uh, I mean, I'm serious. This is great because, I, you know, as per personally, me personally, I was teaching for somebody else in, in his system, and then it became apparent for many reasons I needed to leave. And when I began this, uh, I started doing all these lectures on my own and writing these very detailed lectures, which became part of my book, so it was all good. But it, I spent a million hours on a lecture. It was crazy. But yeah. – um, it, it's a, it, I knew that this was the path I had to do next and work through everything that's going to come up for me, which is what you help these people do, as you start to stand in front and say, I, I, I know what two and two is and I'd like to share it with you. Not that I'm much more than that, but here it is. Yes, and that is part of the reason why I build in the live calls and why we're on the Rizuku platform and people can ask me questions on the platform, type in a question or a comment and I can answer and other people can answer and interact. Because you, if, you, if you're teaching while you're taking the course, you, stuff comes up and I want to be there to help you as well as prepare you for what might come up. And, and again, it's part, a huge takeaway, and everybody you can have this right now, is if you frame teaching as part of your growth journey. It's not a destination. Nation, it's not. It's not that you're going to get it done, and that you're always going to be great at it. And I tell a story about Parker Palmer, who's one of our master teacher interviews. He wrote a book called *The Courage to Teach*. He is a lion and a master in the traditional teaching area, and it's a brilliant man. Please look up his work; you will love it. And one of the things that he says in *The Courage to Teach* is, you know. He he goes into the classroom and he bombs and he's driving home and he's thinking, am I too old now to give it up and do something completely different? And this is a man who's a PhD, a college professor in his 70s who supports other teachers, has an entire foundation for teaching, and he still wrestles with failure and self-doubt. So at, if we can embrace that as part of our work as teachers... As part of our work as creative beings, it can take That's so right. much of the suffering out, and that helps with the projections, because then we don't have to pretend to be somebody we're not when we're teaching, which then separates us from our students, invites unhealthy projections, and then gets us wanting and needing those projections to feed our ego. Well, and what's great about this man who's 70 and still, still pay, the point is, he's awake and aware. If you're going to, you know, go into rote mode, I mean, there are teachers who teach not their soul's desire maybe, but, you know, they're teachers in schools who just go into automatic pilot and they're just doing the rote thing and they're kind of not there. And so yeah. um, well, if he's still paying attention to the students and he failed and they didn't get it, he's like awake. He's there. That's fabulous. That, and that's what we want. And it's scary yeah. to be awake in the teaching situation. It's easier to be awake on my meditation cushion. I'm here alone in my room. Nobody can see me. It's easier <laughs> to even, it's even okay to be awake and aware of the energy between us on this conversation because I'm talking into my computer alone in my room. But when I'm actually in front of people or I'm live and people are asking me questions and we're going back and forth, wow, I'm very exposed. It's a very tender place. And, and that's one of the things that, that we discuss and, and learn to be with and be in the gap between how we hope we teach and how we actually teach. And how can we be in that gap with compassion and awareness? And skillfulness. Like obviously there's tools you can bring in. Lots of tools that we teach you so that you don't so that you know you have the nuts and bolts stuff. It's not all, you know, spiritual work. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but the nuts and bolts come as you do that. I'm just, and if yeah. you take that on as a path, you're going to be the teacher everyone, you know, on your own teaching journey, the, the one everyone needs. We all need to have other people, maybe ahead of us, maybe not, but teaching us something that, that mentor for us how to be real and present and, um, and awake. And awake is about being real, and being real is about running into walls. 
<laughs> yeah, it is. It is. And, and that's one of the four levels of teaching that we go into in module one. And, and that's that level that you're pointing to right now is transmission, is that ineffable feeling of waking your students up to an idea, a way of seeing, a different way of being in their bodies. It's not the information you give them. That's a very important uh, aspect or level of teaching. But the, the, this this transmission level is the is the beingness, our beingness, our inhabiting our own knowing, our walking our talk that makes us the most powerful teachers. Exactly. And I really tried to write my book that way where it felt like a transmission with the words. It's not the same as a person, but to still make the words in a cadence that right. people can feel it. Do you know what I mean? I totally know what you mean, and, and there are books, we all pick up books like that, and we don't know why it has such a profound effect on us. When I was um, 12 and I read Ram Dass's Be Here Now, that yes. book had transmission. Yes, it did. It changed my life forever. You know, when I read um, Michael Singer's book that Oprah discovered a few years ago, um, shoot, I can't see it, what's the name of it, it has the, it has the horse on the cover. Um, that had a transmission for me. Untethered That's like, soul. Untethered soul. soul. Yes, right. yes, that had a transmission. So think, everybody, about the teaching and learning and reading experiences you've had, and maybe including re reading Jennifer's book, that have had that transmission for you. That's a beautiful way in to starting to cultivate that, uh, the ability to do it for others, is to recognize when it's happening to you. And you can feel it right now between you and I if the listeners, you know, let their bodies go into. And I try when I do the radio show to, I mean, we go in and out of all sorts of things, but, you know, to sink down into things as we're talking about them. So we let ourselves be with whatever, whatever's there. And you can feel the difference just when you said that. And if, if anybody was listening about 10 minutes ago, you might have heard my attention go off for a second because my sweetheart texted me and my phone kind of buzzed on my desk. And, and for a moment, my, my attention wasn't here. And that's not to say that when we teach or speak or do anything that our attention is going to be there 100% of the time, but that we recognize, just like in meditation, when it stra strays away, and that we bring it back. And I will actually presence that when I'm teaching live. And I will say, oh my gosh, I got distracted there for a minute. Or I was thinking about what's going to happen next instead of being here with you right now. Can you repeat that? And I found that since I am postmenopausal, I'm 50 and, you know, my mind's not quite the, my memory's not quite what it was. I have to right. really focus or yes. those can just leave me going, oh my God, what did that student just say? Oh my God. And then there is no possibility for transmission. You know, that's a funny thing because when I'm doing this show, I, and with you, I, you know, I, I don't know, I feel so close to you because we've known each other and talked mm -hmm. offline and, and have hung out a little. So, but um, sometimes I, it's a balance for me between being present in the moment with what that person just said that I want to then say, you know, it's a radio show. You can't like have t 10 minutes of silence. People are like, is this, are they still there? You know, um, <laughs> did they die? Is it off? Is it offline? What happened to my computer? So, you know, we got to keep talking, but it's this balance between being present with what they just said and letting myself think about where and trying to, for the listener, ask the next, next weave in the next question. So it's yeah. this, it, which is what you do when you teach too. You've got to, you've got to be holding several balls. You've got to be present, but you've also got to realize, okay, now I got to wrap this section up in 10 minutes because we've got to take a break. Because if you don't, you're one of those teachers that everybody says lunch should have been three hours ago and you're still going on about something. So you have to be mindful of several things at once, don't you? You do, and that comes with practice, but it also for me has come with being transparent with my students. So, and again, you all, everybody, I teach writing, I teach self-care, I teach teaching. I don't, you know, I don't go in and teach engineers in a corporate setting. So this does not work in all settings at all. Although my friend who co-created Teach Now with me in the beginning, Michelle, she is a corporate trainer. So we do incorporate ideas for, for corporate stuff a, a little bit in Teach Now, not dramatically, but somewhat. And so I just want to caveat. So what I'll do is I'll stop and I'll put my hand on my heart and I'll say, you guys, I need to check in with myself for a minute. I need to see what's next. Um, I'll look at my notes. 
I'll look at my watch. As I've gotten more forgetful with age, I make, I keep my computer open and I type in notes to myself. Or I'll make notes of what people are saying, a few little words to myself, so I can be listening to them, but remember. And then I'll look at my notes and say, okay, now what I heard you say, and then I can go off, you know. So you I know, give myself some, some props, I guess, or some, some crutches. I love that because I do that with a radio show. But the thing about TV, when I'm on TV, there I are can't no do that. No, there are no crutches. It's interesting because I'm going to give two speeches. I used to give a lot of keynotes. I don't much anymore. But I'm giving two talks, actually three talks next week in Iowa. And one is in front of a high school. And I'm going to talk about my struggles with depression um, as a kid because I was depressed without knowing it and self-medicated with um, pot and beer. And so, and I'm going to talk about, you know, my journey. And I, I'm like, oh my God, do I bring notes up there with me? You know, what, what's, so it's the same thing as TV. Like there's sometimes when you're not, you can't have crutches or you're not sure what crutches you can have. And, and that's scary to me as I've gotten older and my memory's gotten worse. <laughs> Um, right. PowerPoints can be good for that, though. That is one thing. I'm not using a PowerPoints at all next week, but that is a can be a way to, uh, can be a crutch when you're speaking. Right. Or hopefully they have a podium where you can have your notes up there. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm going to do, I think, and maybe maybe even use my iPad with a big font. I don't know. I have to practice that this weekend. Yeah. Sometimes I just write the talk out, not the whole thing, but most a lot of it, the highlights, and just turn the page. I mean, it's like. Okay, I'm turning a page, but do you want me to say what I wanted to say to you, or do you want me to stand up here and forget what I was going to say? Yeah, yeah. And, that's, and I think the point we're getting to, everyone, is that it's okay to be human. And I think yeah. that is a big gift of, of what I bring in all of my work to the world. Yes, and it is. Gift yes. Each yes. Now. It's okay to be human. We, don't, we, can, we can really be of value when we're human, and we're not perfect. I think we're only of value if we're human. I mean, you know, I mean, we have to find that humanity. I think it's a balance, like what we were talking about earlier. There's certain, like, things that have come on Facebook that I think are hysterically funny, but I realize if I repost them, it just doesn't make sense for Dr. Jennifer Howard to post that. Even though it's funny, it just, it kind of, unless I could talk about it when I posted it and tell you why I thought it was funny, it's kind of off point, like you were talking about. It kind of takes somebody off point. Yes, yes, I know exactly what you mean. And I just had a thought, but it flew out of my head about that. Oh, mm, no, I can't remember what it was. So, yes, That's I agree. Right. <laughs> It'll come back. You know what? We usually take, let's, let's take a three-minute break. We can all go to the bathroom or stretch our legs for a minute here and come back. We're on today with Jennifer Loudon, and we're talking about Teach Now. And by the way, you can go sign up for it right now if you go to drjenniferhoward.tv forward slash radio forward slash Jennifer. Uh, there's the link right there to her Teach Nail program, and she'll talk more about it later. It's not expensive at all. It's amazingly inexpensive. Um, and, uh, and we'll be right back. This is Dr. Jennifer Howard on A Conscious Life. Watch out now. Take care. Beware. Fall and swing Drop it all around you The pain that often lingers In your fingertips Beware of darkness Take care, beware of thoughts that linger. Winding up inside your head. The hopelessness. Sadness. 
champagne Take care, beware And soft shoe shuffling Dancing down the sidewalk Is each unconscious of We're back. Uh, this is Jennifer Howard. This is A Conscious Life. We're talking today with Jen Loudon, a best-selling author, and we're talking about her wonderful program called Teach Now. We talked about if you want to go check it out right now, you can go to drjenniferhoward.tv forward slash radio forward slash Jennifer. You could type Jennifer twice. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> It's fun. It's fun for me. Uh, serving wholeness. I love this. Serving wholeness, creating lasting change. Gee, I don't know anything about creating lasting change. That's like everything I write practically. But this mm -hmm. is great. Serving wholeness, creating lasting change through teaching what you love. That's beautiful. Mm, thank you. It's really beautiful. I, I think these, I mean, it was so interesting for me when I was going through it today because I wanted to, you know, like I looked at the things and I said, I should go to the thing and really check. I was like, man, I want to do this because I'm starting to teach from the book and I'm a little confused because there's so much in my book that I could teach that I'm like, where do I start with this? Like, do I teach this first? Do I teach that first? Yes, and that happens to everybody. I mean, that's a big part of what we talk about throughout the courses is all the different reasons why we think we have to give everybody that we teach the kitchen sink and why that's a really bad idea. And it's a bad idea because then we overwhelm them and they don't learn. It's a bad idea because then we overwhelm them and they don't come back for future retreats and courses and books and so we don't keep earning a sustainable living. It's a bad idea because it exhausts us and makes us resentful of our students. But it's so hard for so many different reasons to say this is the one thing for this class or this is the course core idea for this course or this retreat. But like when you found that core idea when you were writing your book, and it might have taken a while, but in the end when you were rewriting it for the second or third or fourth time, you're like, ah, Seven, 75th time, 75th time. Anyway, go ahead. I, yes. I get it. This is the idea. This is what I'm serving. And everything else has to go away. It has to be chopped out or, or, kind, or, or diluted or, or edited back, pruned. And we have to do the same thing when we teach. We have to find the core idea. And sometimes we don't begin at the beginning. And I don't mean to sound like Yoda, but sometimes it's like we begin where we want to begin, where we're most interested. And that is so true. That is so true because many people have said to me, your book is so deep. And I said, well, that's what's interesting to me. You know, I mean, I wrote what, what turned me on. I mean, you know, so... And so that, and that, that's another beautiful piece, though, Jennifer, is you know this material. You've lived it for all these years. So it can be hard to step back into yes. the beginner's mind. But that's what we need to do. Where you, we can do it with a little visualization, like, where was I when I got that piece that started me on this journey? And if I was that person, what out of all this material in this book would most help me really integrate and move from that place, make it real, make that awakening have some legs and some foundation. And then you start there and you teach it once or twice and then you see, oh no, that I need to add this little piece in or I need to leave this out or you know, it's this constant iteration without trying to reinvent the wheel. Because if you reinvent the wheel, then you'll exhaust yourself and you won't make any money. And I think what you said earlier is so important because I was thinking as you were talking about how when I first started teaching like some of the things that are chapters in here now and some of the chap some of the things I taught I didn't even put in the chapters it just too much it was too the book was too much, um, but at, I remember the first couple of times I taught I talked from such a deep place in consciousness that I lost a lot of people and I was yes. like oh man. <laughs> So I learned by teaching and boo-booing. I mean, when, when, the, when the audience is glassing over, I'm like, whoa, okay, all right. What's questions, anybody? <laughs> <laughs> and that's, I mean, this happens to everybody, especially when you're in deep spiritual topics or more complex topics. The difference that makes a uh, crappy teacher from a good teacher is we go, oh, my God, I'm doing it. 
And then even in the moment, we can course correct. Even in the moment, we can say, well, I can see that this is getting away from us. Let's, let's, I throw, I'm willing to, we're willing to throw out our lesson plan, our objectives, our planned exercises, and, and meet what's there with the people we're there with. And sometimes, frankly, we get too scared and we stay with our lesson plan and we drown everybody with information and, and then we can't recalibrate till next time. And that's okay, too. Yeah, it yeah. Just, it's such an experience. Wow, what a... So how many times have you taught this, this, this thing now, Teach Now? Gosh, I think this will be the seventh time that I lose track. I'm terrible at dates and numbers. I'm, I'm mildly dyslexic, and it really comes up around patterns and numbers and uh, any kind of organizational stuff. So I, it's been six or seven times. <laughs> That's okay. That's good enough. Six or seven is fine. So, yeah, so you feel that you're at a perfect position. In a funny way, you've taught it enough now to really get the groove with it, haven't you? And Saul, so you've seen where you need to add things. Speaking of teaching, you've kind of created this the same way you're telling people to create what you're telling them, helping them create, right? Uh, yes, and a big value in the course is that I, throughout the pre-recorded call, so the classes um, are all pre-recorded except the first one. I'm, doing, I'm teaching that live this time, and I'll tell you why in a moment. But mm -hmm. they, in the calls, the classes that you listen to, and there's transcripts of them all, I, Michelle and I pull back the curtain. We say, oh, we're pulling back the curtain, and we point out what we just did. And sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. So that people can be being taught, being in the experience, and then they can jump up 10,000 feet and see it happening. So that's a really cool thing that we invented. And then I, I actually want to go back and talk about why I'm teaching the class, the first class of the, of the six modules live this time. And again, it will be recorded. You don't have to be there live. But it's because I needed to juice it up a little bit so I could stay engaged and I needed to inject a little newness to it. And that's something you want to do if you're, if you're teaching material over and over again. You need to give yourself little places as a speaker, teacher, whatever, to improv, to add in some of your new knowledge so that you stay as juicy and engaged and it doesn't get to be rote or otherwise the transmission can fall away. You know, that's beautiful because I, you know, I tend to, in my past, pick teachers and stay with them for a long time. That's been mm -hmm. my pattern because I, I, I've also studied everything there was to study. So I did, you know, take a weekend with that person and a weekend with that person or a week with that person. But many of the teachers I was with 13, 12 years and, and saw them often uh, and saw the same lectures over and over. So, and because it was alive, it, it, I got it more deeply. So, you know, people who want to take your workshop again, they'll get this more deeply when they hear it again. And because you're enlivening this first session for yourself, it, it makes the whole thing uh, come alive and, and, and you get to go more deeply into it. Exactly, exactly. And, and another way that you can do that is when you're prepping your material, redo one of the exercises that you're teaching so that you encounter the material again where you are now and that can reignite your excitement for the material because one of the things that is tricky about teaching something over and over again is you forget the impact that it can have on people because the impact it had on you is farther and farther in the in the distance so you have to reignite that learning kind of relearn it and then your excitement will be in there even if you're just showing up on a platform like Ruzuku and answering people's questions maybe there's no live component in your online teaching um, or maybe you're delivering you know the lecture that you deliver every spring to your freshman comp students you can do the same thing. You can reread those poets that you love and, and, and find the magic, even if it's only for a few minutes. It does you so much good for your teaching. Mm -hmm. I was just feeling that as you were saying it. Yeah, because I, what I have trouble with is I have trouble, and I've done these teleconferences where I'm just talking to the air. Oh, God, yeah. And it's hard for me. I'm much better when I'm like with you because I'm feeling you, um, you know, are alive. I'm feeling people. I've got to learn how to do it when I'm talking out to the world, but it just feels like I'm talking to this wall I'm looking at. And it doesn't, even though I can feel some people listening, I don't know exactly how to embody that differently. Do you have any advice, uh, yeah. great Jen Loudon? What would, what would you say to me? 
Yes, great, Jennifer Howard. I have some advice. Um, I think that one of the things we can do, and um, I talk about this in Teach Now, is how is steel structures and adapt them to what works for us as teachers. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel. I teach this in my writing retreats to steel structure as a writer. It's a very time honored principle. We can do it as teachers too. So steal the structure that I'm going to use. Um, I'm doing a free call for teach now and on tomorrow and in that call I have to I have to get in enough material that I can't take Q&A from people but I hate talking to the air like you do so I have two guests who are alums of Teach Now coming on the call with me so I can play off of them I can get energy from them I can ask them questions and I have uh, my VA will be on the call with me too. So start looking for ways that people are getting interaction that you can get and set it up. And, and this is another thing that I teach and teach now in module four or five is all about self-care. Self-care is the hardest thing, ironically, given what my first books were about, that I've had to learn as a teacher because that really helps me to do a better job. So if I set myself up and I just think I have to show up and do this teleseminar this way because that's the way it's always done or that's the way the presenters want it, immediately I start to leak energy transmission. I get resentful. But if I think, what would be juicy for me? What would, how can I adjust? And maybe I don't know, so then I go out there and I steal from other people. Never content, but like, oh, look, Jen had guests on. Well, maybe I could have guests on. Is it okay to ask for help? Yes, it's okay to ask for help. People love to help. That's great. So that's my yeah. idea. That's my yeah, that's my great. That's my great idea. The great Jennifer Howard. <laughs> Aha, you're funny. No, that's great because I I am not. I mean, I think about like. You know, there are people who do radio talk shows and they talk for two hours. Yeah. And I think, wow, I, I mean, I could look at stuff to talk about, but I, I it's the feedback loop that, uh, that feels so good to me, you know, yeah. that I, then opens me up somehow. Exactly. And that's another thing. As all creative beings, we have to learn what is the style that I best thrive in and how can I get that situation, that setting, that support, those conditions more of the time. And so if you, I'm the same way. My best teaching comes in a group of about 30 people, 25 to 30 people. We're in a circle. We've done some exercises. I've presented a little tiny bit of information. They've interacted with each other. And then we sit in a big circle and stuff comes up. And I, stuff comes out of my mouth I can't believe. Mm -hmm. Right? So that, and I can't do that too many times a year, but can I do it enough to keep myself juicy? Can I weave that, mimic that in online and virtual experiences? Um, mm -hmm. When I don't have enough of that, I get really dry as a teacher and it's not fun for me and then I don't want to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. The same thing is true, I'll say, um, one of the things that a lot of us non-traditional teachers have to do that we don't like to do is marketing, getting the word out. So I know that that's part of my work as a teacher. I do it in different ways that are a, a, the least draining, but I also know that at the end of this launch period next Tuesday when Teach Now closes to new students and it closes so the people are in the room and we can get started. I don't like to leak energy with people coming in a week late, so I don't let them in. And that's my choice. That's my self-care as a teacher. And it also takes care of my students to learn. I know I'll be really tired of marketing. I'm not going to do it again for a while. And I have to learn to build my year so those periods of putting a lot of energy out and saying, look at this, look at this, are limited because they drain me. Because yes. it's not... It's not my natural, it's not where I get my, my juju from marketing. Some people do. There's nothing wrong with that at all. I, more power to you. To me, it's a necessary part of my work so people know my work exists. Oh, I totally feel like it's a necessary. The only thing I have been enjoying is doing all these radio, speaking of radio shows, doing all these radio shows with other people. Uh, that marketing my book that way has been yeah, the least fun. painful. Yes. <laughs> Yes, I like to talk too. <laughs> because we're interacting, right? We're interacting. But I bet you, you're an introvert, aren't you? I am. Me too. Me too. Believe it or not, yeah. So I, 
And it's been this very, very outer time in my life with a lot of travel and visiting and people visiting me. And then it's spring and I live in the Pacific Northwest, everybody. So spring is very dramatic, like the light returns in a matter of weeks and the everything starts to grow and you, you, you just feel it like everybody's eyes are big and bright and and it's a lot for an introvert to handle. So I have to, I'm really still painfully learning how to take care of myself in these extroverted times. Because I really, I can't tell you how happy I am that nobody's home with me this week. Everybody's gone. And even the dogs are a little bit much. <laughs> <laughs> no, I totally get guys, it. Why don't you stay in the house and I'll just go out to my office alone. <laughs> No, it's so, probably good. It's probably a good balance between you. Your husband's probably, is he a little more of an extrovert or more introvert? He's more, a little bit more of an extrovert, but he does, um, he, it's interesting because he, he tests just a little bit on the extrovert side. And I, my first husband, I was married with, with Chris for 23 years. He was very, he was more of an introvert than I was. So we did a lot of parallel play. And, um, and, and Bob, my, my, my beloved now, he's like, I love you. I want to be with you all the time. <laughs> and you're like, that's lovely. Go away for 10 minutes. <laughs> we were on vacation in Nicaragua in February, and we were walking down the street, and I said something about vacation. He goes, well, my idea of vacation is I just have you all to myself. And I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> that's cute. Because really? Really? Are you sure that's your idea of a vacation? <laughs> and we're learning to negotiate that, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, uh, my husband is uh, a little more introverted. Well, actually, a lot more introverted than I am. Uh, and when we first met, my first husband had been more talkative and uh, was probably an introvert too, but probably more extrovert than me. And so it was this contrast at first. It was like, wow, I went from talkative, talkative, talkative to silence. And I love it, but it took me a while to adjust because I was so used to the other. You know, so what do you. What do people need to know right now about what have we not covered that you feel like you need to say about this? Um, I think what's really important to know is that, a, is that if you're excited, passionate, or angry about something in the world, one of the ways to change it is to teach. And if you're needing to grow an individual practice, if you're a naturopath or a coach or a health coach or you know, even a doctor, one of the ways to do it is teaching. And if you're an artist or a creative or a writer and you need more income sources, one of the ways to get that is teaching. And believe it or not, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics has found that non-traditional self-enrichment teaching is the fastest growing, one of the fastest growing sectors of the market. So there it's real. And yes, it, you have to wear a lot of hats. You do have to learn how to market yourself. Although, you know, there is adult education centers. There's, there's some ways to get experience and get a leg up on that. But it's really possible to change the world, have an impact and take care of yourself. It's really, really possible to do that. Wow, thank you. This is uh, so wonderful, sweetie. It's so great to connect to you, too. And I'm so glad you came back on the show. We'll have to have you more often. I think it's been two years or something since you were here. That's just silliness. You were starting. You were just starting the show. I think I was one of your first guests. You were. I asked you to please come be a guinea pig, and you were kind yeah. enough to let me experiment on you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. No, I think everyone. So I'm going to give you again. This is called Teach Now, and I think anybody who is in that qualification that Jen just said, you know, you're a speaker, you're passionate about something, you're angry. I think that's brilliant, too, because I get angry about stuff and go, what? And that inspires a blog sometimes or inspires yeah. me to do stuff. So absolutely. You know, I think it's important to notice what moves us. And, and you're saying then you can teach whatever you want to about that or move into something that's, that, 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 that increases your income. And you go to drjenniferhoward.tv forward slash radio forward slash Jennifer. DrJenniferHoward.tv forward slash radio forward slash Jennifer. And we have the link there for you to go and sign up. Now, this is ridiculously inexpensive. How much is it? 
Well, there's a self-guided version that's $250, and the full meal deal is $350. And it really is, I mean, I know this is such a, sounds like such a sleazy thing to say, but it really is worth about four or five times that much. But I feel so, I feel like it's important to have programs in the world that really help people that don't cost thousands of dollars. And so that's what I do. And I hope that enough people will take it, you know, that it's a nice part of my income. And, um, you know, by offering it each time and, you know, kind of perfecting it so that I have to be, you know, a little bit less involved in content creation, um, that helps that helps make it more profitable for me as well. But it is um, an incredible deal. <laughs> it is. I mean, I looked at it and it went, I thought that were I thought they were payments. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I thought the first payment was three fifty. I was like, girl, you know, I love that about you because both of us are not about, you know, charging. We had what was one of the first conversations we had. We both, you know, kind of bristle at folks who charge twenty thousand dollars for a day or something. It's like what? You know. Yeah, I think it puts too much pressure. I, it's interesting. Um, I was talking to somebody about this, and they had bought a, a, a two thousand dollar course, and they said, you know, the they, the the course was good, but that it wasn't worth that, and that the spending the two thousand dollars put so much pressure on them well, to try to eke out everything they could out of it that it was actually getting in the way of learning. So we want, though, I want to caution everybody who is listening, though, don't undercharge from a place of unworthiness and over-delivering, because right. that's not good either. And don't, don't overcharge from a place of inflation. Like, do you know who I am? Because that's not sustainable, at least for your, for your inner work. So we have to find the sweet spot. And I have a pretty big following and a big platform. So, you know, we usually have a couple hundred students go through this every time. So, yeah, I could be making a couple hundred thousand dollars instead of forty or fifty thousand dollars, but I'm okay with that. I'm I look at my life, I live my life in a way that's very affordable. I live in an affordable place, and these are all choices I've made. And that doesn't make me moral or better than anybody else. It's just that's my values and it's important to me that I live them. I think it's lovely. I wish I lived in a more affordable place. <laughs> I don't have a big, I don't mean, by that I don't mean I have a big expensive house, but I live in the tri-state area and it's just so expensive in the New York area. Good golly, it's crazy. No, no. I know. I used to live in Montecito. I left Montecito, California, Santa Barbara for here. And that was one of the reasons I did it because my nut was spart- starting to drive my creative decisions. But in two years, a little bit more than that, we may well move to Boulder, Colorado, which is twice as expensive as here. So for my sweetheart's work. So, you know, life happens. We are where we are and we make the adjustments that we have to make. Absolutely. And I, um, I feel called still to be here uh, near television, near New York City. You know, I have an apartment in the city. So, um, you know, I just feel like it's still where I'm supposed to be. But sometimes I think, I talk to these other writers and they live in little places where it's cheap to live. And I think, geez, you know, it's, uh, it's, an, interesting, it's an interesting journey, isn't it? It is an interesting journey, and, and as long as we have people to do it with, we have communities to do it with, and this is a community, yes, yes. everybody, you have of Jennifer, Jennifer's community, it makes it a lot easier. But remember, we also need community in person, not just online, not just on yes. the air. We need to be face-to-face with people. Um, yes. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you for coming back, and I want everyone to go, and if, this, if you feel called to do this, go to drjenniferhoward.tv forward slash radio forward slash Jennifer, and, uh, and sign up for Jen's, and then let me know what you think as you're doing it, because I might be there. I don't know yet. I'm, I'm going to talk to you later. We're going to talk chat later anyway. We are. Um, um, and everyone, thank you. Uh, we're almost out of time today, and I have we have somebody after us now, the show, so we have to end on time, which is hard for me to do it exactly on the right minute. So um, thank you so much, everyone, for listening and taking your time, and I hope that we sparked something in you, even though we were talking about a particular program, but I hope that you kind of got some good juice out of this for yourself today. And as always, I look forward to your feedback. Info at drjenniferhoward.com. Let me know as you're reading the book what you're thinking um, on Twitter and Facebook and, and 